The Zone Coverage Podcast Network. They may be drinkers, Robin, but they're also human beings. Hell yeah, let's get Stinko. Welcome, Giles and Goli Podcast, the hockey podcast where we were rushed into starting this recording so our significant others could talk about wedding stuff. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. I am your host, Giles Farrell. Across the table for me is noted Golden Knights fan, Ben Remington. Hello. Uh, we are on location, trying our first on locale podcast since the ill-fated Vegas <laughs> podcast. <laughs> the that cease and desist was, podcast. Yeah, that was the cut and get out. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, we tried to uh, put our thoughts together after uh, quite an oh. afternoon of, uh, of spiritous beverages. But, no, we're on locale here in our favorite uh, bar and grill pub of St. Paul. Yes. It's good to be back. We just watched Tiger Woods win the Masters. Mm-hmm. Uh, takes us back to uh, some more youthful <laughs> days of ours. <laughs> also takes us back to the Marty Havlat days of the Minnesota Wild. If you're Ugh. wondering who was on the Wild roster the last time Tiger Woods won a major tournament. Wolf. Yeah, I think I'm going to go to MySpace and open up a page again. Just There just you go. For... I'm actually looking this up because... <clears throat> I actually want to know what the wild roster looks like when Tiger Woods last won a Dane Moore tweeted out major the Wolves uh, roster, and uh, it was it was pretty ugly. So Tiger Woods last won a major tournament in 2008. He won the U.S. Open. Yeah. So that would have been the 2007 2008 Minnesota Wild. Yeah. That did win the Northwest they Division did. title. That's true. Yeah. The Soul hanging banner from the rafters <laughs> of XL Energy Center. The soul hanging meaningful banner. Yes, uh, yes, yes. Let's clarify. Yeah. Uh, but if you want to talk uh, some names of the roster at the time, uh, we have uh, Eric Belanger. Yeah, I have a signed puck from him. Keith Carney, who was the Wild's plus oh. minus leader in a season <laughs> until like two years ago. All right. Uh, we have Todd Fedoric. Oh, the fridge. The fridge. Yeah. Uh, Curtis Foster, Matt Foy, Sean Hill. How could we forget oh. Sound St. Paul's own Sean Hill? Uh, or was yeah. he from White Bear Lake? I don't remember. He was born in Duluth, oh, so there's that. Neither. Uh, then uh, you have Kim Janssen. How could we yeah. forget him? Oh, yeah. The uh, Pateri Numelin, the shootout expert of uh, the Wild that season. This is a jog. <laughs> Benoit Pouliot. Oh, Nobody yeah. will ever forget no, that guy. No, I, he's, yeah, he's unfortunately. Radio. Bronco Radovojevic. <laughs> that was his nickname, Radio. I just ad lib with some queen. Oh, okay. Uh, then we have Nick Schultz, yeah. James Shepard, Chris Simon, noted trade deadline acquisition, oh Chris God. Simon. You're going all in with Chris Simon, baby. <laughs> Then you have Martin Scula, yeah, Steve Veyu, and then, uh, of course, uh, His Holiness himself, Aaron Voros. Wow. I forgot about Aaron Voros, too. Uh, Benoit Pouliot played 11 games that season, BT <laughs> Dubs. Uh, that was the Backstrom era, correct? Was that Nicholas Backstrom? Nicholas Backstrom was your goaltender for the Minnesota okay, Wild. That's what I thought. Backup Josh Harding. Oh, okay. Yep. And that was pre-MS, correct? Noted. Nicholas Backstrom started 56 games. Josh Harding started 25. Well, that's pretty solid. Novel concept. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine that. Was that the one year where, gosh, was that the one year, because that doesn't add up to 71, or that adds up to 71 at 72. Is that the one where, like, some random goalie started one game, got absolutely destroyed, and we never saw him again. Well, it's weird. They're not even listed here on Hockey Reference. 
Did they only play 71 games? They played 82 games, but Backstrom and Harding. Oh, no, that's 81. Sorry. 81, but still. Backstrom and Harding told 81. Huh. Weird. That's that's weird. Who uh, to talk all I can to, think of is like to talk to Hans von Sluten about this. He really doesn't work Zach there anymore. Bjerk or something like yeah, that. Yeah, that's what I that's what I was thinking like, about. Is like there was I, I forget which season it was, but a goalie came up, literally made one start, got his clock positively cleaned, and then we never saw him again. I'm just looking at egregious losses for the Minnesota Wild <laughs> that season. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, it, it nothing. Nothing. Yeah. Nothing yeah. comes to fruition, I guess. But that's neither here nor there. So yeah, that was uh, that was a thing today. Tiger Woods won the Masters, so we ventured back into time and saw what the Wild roster looked like the last time he won a Master. Now, of course, you have your Victor Rasks, your <laughs> Eric Fears. <laughs> <laughs> your JT Brown. When Tiger, uh, Greg you know, Patterson. If, if he doesn't win a master, or if he doesn't win a, a major for another, you know, 10 years or something like that, we're going to look back on this roster and be like, oh my God, that was when the playoff streak ended. God, that team was bad. Anthony Batetto. <laughs> that name is going to make my blood boil <laughs> a decade from now. Matt Reed. Yeah. Uh, be like, who the hell is Matt Reed? Yeah. So that's. That is that. Um, yeah, it was a not a, a lot of newsworthy things from Minnesota Wild this week, but they did have their end of season presser, yeah, uh, featuring Paul Fenton and Bruce Boudreau. I had to think about his name for a minute. You've had a couple of drinks. It's okay. Yeah, which Paul Fenton in the presser revealed to everyone, including Bruce Pedreau, that Bruce was coming back for a fourth season behind the Minnesota Wild bench, <laughs> which, uh, hey, good good on you, I guess, but way to, way to let Bruce know before so he's not floored at the, at the podium. Well, but, I mean, when they announced the presser and they said it would be featuring Fenton and Boudreau, I mean, you kind of assume that Boudreau is coming back. Um you know, because if Boudreau would have been fired, let's you know he would have been fired the day after the season ended, right? Like if if Fenton would have gotten his wish, and uh, Leopold would have cleared him firing Boudreau, he would have done it immediately after the last game. So the fact that it wasn't done on Sunday, you know, if it wasn't done on Sunday, I don't know that it was going to happen anytime after that. He was very pointed in saying that. Bruce was his head coach for next year. Yeah, I he, know. He made it what very wording. clear that that was what? next year. What word? And not anything beyond, uh, but making it very well known that maybe there could be a change beyond that, but Bruce is the head coach next year. He should have he should have qualified even more to be like, Bruce is going to be our head coach starting next year. Uh, Bruce <laughs> is going to start next year as our head coach. And come November, I'm going to fire him for my buddy. Fire him for Craig Berube, who we hope will take him on a long <laughs> run like he's doing right now. Oh, wait. No, Craig Berube will probably stay in charge of the... Yeah, I would assume so. I saw Mike Yo could be a candidate for the Buffalo Sabres job, and what a complete waste that would be for Jack Eichel. <sighs> well, I mean, he could add another coach to his... Graveyard. Yeah, he could. He, it's like a stamp on the side of a fighter plane. Um, yeah, I, I don't. You know, I, I know there's a lot of Mike Yo fans in Minnesota still for some ungodly reason. But uh, I mean, how is that guy still getting that kind of? Well, you saw what happened in St. Louis. Like they were awful. And granted, a lot of that did have to do with Jake Allen. And then after he was fired, obviously, yeah, weird. Jordan Bennington did take over and, and has played very well. But at the same time, like, what? Like, maybe give him a season. You know what I mean? Like, if you're going to hire Mike Yo as your head coach, maybe make it a couple of years from now. Like, y you don't want to hire the guy that literally just got fired less than a calendar a year ago. Um, Christ, it was probably only six months ago. And now his successor is doing great things with the roster that he could do nothing with. I feel like at this point, Mike Yo is going to be like a career assistant or like a minor league coach, kind of like what John Torchetti has kind of settled into. Yeah. Like where he is going to either just be an assistant on an NHL team or a 
head coach of like a minor league or you know like a junior team essentially like yeah. i feel like that's what's going to be in his future like sorry if that offends somebody out there but it really shouldn't it's the truth like i know that mike yo has i've heard from everybody that he's a great guy and i, and I believe that but it just doesn't mean that he's an nhl code yeah so there what what were we talking about the press conference. Bruce was coming back. There you yes. go. Yeah. Uh, we are very relieved that Bruce is coming back. Yes. It gives us at least, uh, you know, maybe next year some more Bruce Pedro quality audio. Yes. Uh, but. Gifts. Yeah. A- and gifts. <laughs> like, I, I noted the other day it was the first anniversary of the infamous Bruce gif where he just screams the F word on the <laughs> bench. That was after game one in Winnipeg in the playoffs last year. That tweet did really well. It's just uh, like, yeah. happy anniversary to this gift, and it just, like, <laughs> went off. And I'm just like, okay. And then, which is actually my favorite, I didn't, I should have pointed this out, I didn't make this gif, but somebody took the same gif, and then they just captioned it. When yeah. Bruce says the F word, they just put darn mm. in the gif, <laughs> yeah, which great. is very good. I don't yes. know who actually did that, but that is very good. Yes. I always laugh at that. Jamie's also relieved. Bruce is coming back. She likes Bruce. Yeah. How can you not like Bruce? Bruce Bruce was choice one for wedding officiant. Oh, I apologize, okay. but we're we're settling in for a backup. Well, you still have time. I mean, he could get <laughs> fired mid season and you could try I mean, he'll be in the area probably. Yeah, he's I mean, he still has to like move out of his house. Right. I mean, maybe if he's fired after the end of next season, he's still kind of in the area for the next week or so. Yeah. There you just, go. Just catch him and just give him a script. There's still hope. Give him your script. You don't have to settle. Yeah. <laughs> Shoot high. Yeah. <laughs> the anti Mietnan story. Yeah. <laughs> yes. This is a great. This could be a great podcast for throwback wild references. Yeah, we can do that. We're just killing it. Um, yeah. So Bruce Pedro coming back next year. That is something actually you and I both agree on. That yeah. should be done as the season went awash, but not for Bruce being at fault for anything. Although he was just kind of giving the old uh, number one finger salute to Paul Finn when he was bringing in his guys and just be like, "Here's your guys. They're terrible." Looking at you, Anthony Batetto. Yeah. Yeah, I, I got to wonder how that relationship evolves because, you know, from everything we've heard, they probably don't see eye to eye. And, and it's... No, know, they don't. And and from everything we heard, you know, even Russo himself, uh, Brudeau's only going to be around next season because Craig Leopold wants him around. And, and Paul Fenton very much doesn't. And so this is a situation where... They're just playing out Bruce's contract, and then I don't know. You know, we talked last week with Tom about the two years of you know his consultant gig. Um, we'll see what happens with that, but I really would be shocked to see Bruce around the following season. Uh, Tom, in any I love capacity. you, but no, those two years of consulting things are just for show, man. Like Bruce is going to coach again somewhere. Like I know is he, he said. Though? I know he said this is going to be his last stop. He's like but 65. I feel like in his heart of hearts, he's going to give one more kick at the can somewhere to try to win the cup. Like, I feel like he thought this was going to be better when he uh, signed on here. Although, to be fair, his only other option at the time was Ottawa, so <laughs> Bruce did make the correct call. He nailed that choice. Although, uh, I forget his name. Guy Boucher actually yes. did get a lot closer to the Stanley Cup final than Bruce has in that's the time, true. but that's neither here nor there. Right. Uh, but but still, I, I think that, yeah, I don't know. I feel like I, Bruce is only here because Craig Leopold wants him to be here, and that it's kind of sad in a way that he's a lame duck coach. Or do you, do you think that's yeah. going to be an issue at all? I, I think it is. I. Yeah. It's never a good thing unless you're Barry Trotz. <laughs> to be a lame duck coach in the last year of your contract and you don't have an extension going into that last year, I I can envision it's going to be a, a very good thing for the Wild going into the next year. That's actually something I'll kind of be concerned about. But, uh-huh. you know, if Bruce does good things, then maybe 
you know, they give him an extension. You know, it remains to be seen, but I don't buy it. I, I think Bruce will probably be a goner by, you know, the All-Star break next year, sadly. But, you know, unless the Wild are like a President's Trophy team. First sign of trouble, you know, if, if they go through a swoon next year, that, that's pretty much the death. Swoon ball. early, baby. Yeah, well, if they, yeah, if they do swoon early, it's going to be over for them. If they, if they swoon later in the season and they're still they're in comfortable enough playoff position to where they can kind of weather a little bit, I think he can survive that. But if you have a swoon, you know, especially out of the gate or even in November or, you know, you, you're not in playoff contention by the, that magical Thanksgiving mark, I think you're looking at him losing his job very early. So it's entirely possible. So the other thing that was uh, newsworthy from the year-end uh, presser was that Zach Parisi played on a broken foot wow. uh, through the end of the year, which... You know, we kind of suspected that Sounds something painful. was going on, uh, but, you know, really kind of derailed an otherwise great season for him uh, point production-wise. And, you know, if he had been able to kind of sustain his pace before the injury, like, it would have put him really in a kind of an historic level for 34-year-olds in terms of points per game, sure. which I had noted really early in the year. But... That was the other thing. And then you had Paul Fenton's impassioned plea to the media to not reveal <laughs> injuries. <laughs> and this is a good talking point. Oh, crazy pills. Because I don't, I don't know. I, I guess I don't see the value in just holding this stuff back now. It's like these guys are going to yeah. heal up before the start of next <laughs> season. Like, and everybody knows what Koivu's problem is. Koivu's going to be the only one that's got something lingering going into next year, maybe. But, and yeah. do you uh, agree with his, like, plea to, like, not have this these injuries disclosed? Because I, don't, I, I, I can see it where he's coming from because there are vicious players out there who oh, will sure. see that and they will go after these players' previous injuries, but... I, it's tough for me. It's like I, I feel like that's something y you have to put out there. But Paul Finn also isn't like the most media savvy type of guy, so <laughs> I think that has more to do with it than anything. Yeah, I, I don't agree with it at all. And and you know, hockey is shrouded enough. How many times a season do we hear lower body injury? Like, so what is he upset about? Like, I. You're going to tell people after, the, like you said, after the season, when Zach, by next October, Zach Breezy's foot is going to be fine. And players can hack away at his foot all they want. I mean, it's not going to be any different than hacking at his non injured foot at that point. So who cares? And so it's just, it's more, I, I, don't, I don't know. It, it, you know, it just doesn't make a lot of sense to me. And, and I certainly understand that why you would keep those things guarded during the season. It's why we get the upper body injury. It's why we get the lower body injury crap. I, I totally get it. It's a fast game. There is very, very, you know, malicious players out there. I get it. But after the season is over and it, yeah, what's it's the point? something that's not going to linger, I mean, who cares? Yeah, it's not like you're going to be facing Nazem Kadri next night out. <laughs> Tom Wilson's going he's gonna to he's gonna fly to Minneapolis. And he's going to stomp on Zach Preezy's left foot as hard as he can just because he knows which foot is injured now. He's going to go wolf stancing on <laughs> Koivu's knee. I know, right? <laughs> yeah, it's just like, you know. Uh, I've uh, slipped an anti Mietnin and wolf stancing <laughs> reference into the first 20 minutes of this show. I mean, eventually Adam Banks' wrist got better, right? Like, eventually th injuries heal. It wasn't even a storyline in the second and third movie. Like, it just... No, it was in the second movie, not yeah. in the third movie. Well, so no, it's Adam fine. Banks was on the varsity. Yeah, yeah, well, exactly. He was better, so cake eater. <laughs> I again, like it's such a fine line, but I, I see where he's kind of coming from. But at the same time, as I said, he's not somebody who overly likes to deal with the media. Anytime you see Paul <laughs> Finn put in front of a microphone. He looks like he would rather be in North Korea. Yeah. Like, 
anywhere else in the world he would rather be than in front of the microphone talking about things. And I'm sure that's like the scout in him, but this is something I like. I feel like he needs to get better at over the next couple of seasons because that is a part of his job now. He's yeah. no longer just the assistant general manager or the assistant to the general manager. <laughs> he's no longer the guy out there just scouting. Like He's the guy that makes the ultimate decisions on roster moves, and you have to face the media for these things. And how many times did we hear about after he made some kind of a move that he'd be angry because this got out to the media because Russo always gets it. Like, <laughs> just admit it, guy. You're defeated. Like, Russo knows what's going on much, much before you would like to care for. Well, I, I, I feel like sometimes Russo knows what's going on before Fenton does, um, you know, which That's is as, as connected as Russo is. It's right. not really that surprising. Like, so you may have your organization on <laughs> lockdown, but... <laughs> right. He Not has many with. other avenues to get that information. Yeah. Anyway, I and it, this is another thing with the way the league is going. Like, look at these sponsor deals that they've now made with, like, these gambling places. Oh yeah, like MGM Resorts is huge plastered deal. on all ices right now yep. in the playoffs because yep. they're a major sponsor with the National Hockey League. Like, this is, like, information that has to become more available to the average person because of gambling purposes. Yeah, yeah, no, for sure. And if Joe Schmo, like me, is going to sit in front of a sports book in Las Vegas, I'd really love to right now, let's be <laughs> honest. Uh, I need to know, like, what is ailing this player? Like, Zach Parise having a broken foot? Yeah, that's probably something you I would love to know if I am in the... Uh, wagering community well and not just you but the people setting the odds themselves i mean the sports books yeah you don't want to lose that kind of money right and and like this is where your bread is going to be buttered um with this you know sports unless you're deal. allowing a 85 grand bet on tiger woods that pays <laughs> out 1.19 million oh it sucks for them um <laughs> but yeah be like, okay yeah yeah it's yeah sports books will always be okay but th that's exactly right. And and so, you know, MGM paying a ton of money to be a partner of the NHL. And the NHL actually doing something smart for once and getting themselves kind of ahead of the curve a little bit on this whole sports betting thing. Yeah. You don't want to screw that up. And so you don't want a sea of NHL GMs saying, don't report injuries. Don't, don't you know, don't tell anything, any anybody anything about our teams. Well, I'm sorry, but that's the lifeblood of the sports book. So you, it's just not going to happen. And he needs to be re more realistic about it. Uh, the only other kind of thing we got out of the end of year presser was that the Wild would like to get Jared Spurgeon to a contract extension. Yay. Uh, what Jared Spurgeon wants maybe remains to be seen, but uh, going into next season, which is the last in the contract for Jared Spurgeon, uh, he is kind of arguably the Wild's best defenseman. Yeah. I, you know, respect to Mr. Madison, Ryan Suter, but and Mr. Dumba. But yeah, no, it, it's you can make a very good argument. Just a uh, cap hit of five point one eight million for Jared Spurgeon next year, uh, which is the last of his. It's not even on here. Oh, yeah, it is. Uh, his four-year, uh, twenty. Point seven five million dollar contract that he signed mm -hmm. in the 2015. Mm -hmm. You gotta go way back. I remember that because we all thought he was gonna be dealt because he was, uh, you know, he was kind of looks like looked like the odd man out in that situation. Um, and here we are back again, yeah, where he kind of looks like the odd man out in the situation. Um, but the Wild seem to be committed, and, and good on them for being committed to bring him back. I don't even know. I mean, he'll he'll get a pay raise, but I don't even I don't think it's going to be exorbitant. I don't think he's going to. I, mean, I I would I would assume he'd come in somewhere on the six million dollar mark. I was thinking like six and a half million. Yeah, I, I think that's maybe where six and a half, six seven five. I think kind yeah, of more his I, I don't range. see him going over seven by much if he no. does. Um, but it is a pay raise, and and it is. You know, wrapping him along long term is probably you know something that it depends on what they what they think their window is. And another thing from the press conference, Paul Fenton said this isn't a rebuild. He doesn't want to rebuild. 
he wants to rebuild on the fly or, or reload on the fly or whatever the terminology may be, well, okay, that's nice, but you're going to need to keep around some good players then. And Jared Spurgeon's obviously a big part of that. I feel like they have to resign him because they you're essentially putting Matt Dumba as the lone right-handed defenseman on yeah. your roster well, who can do anything. Yeah, Greg Paterin is, yeah, he's Greg Paterin. But if you do trade Spurgeon, then maybe part of that package has to include a young right-handed shot defenseman who can maybe be something someday. But, again, you don't know what the rest of the league really values wild players at because I think we've kind of seen what Minnesota values wild players at is significantly more than what the rest of the NHL values them at. (laughs) Right. And uh, I'm not going to reference... a trade that was made this year <laughs> with Carolina, but, you know, I'm going to. Uh-huh. Victor Rask. Yeah. Christ. <laughs> um, I, I don't know. It, it feels like they have to bring him back, but then again, what do I know? I'm just an idiot with a microphone. Sure. But – you would be dealing a major blow to your defensive core yeah. by trading him. And if you're just kind of trading him for futures, then you're really, I think that really shows you're punting on next season. Yeah, no, I would absolutely agree. And that's what I'm saying. If he thinks that they are, you know, their expectations for next season is to be a playoff team and they are not a rebuilding team. Um, the Jared Spurgeon, I mean, and it's one thing if, they can't possibly get an extension done. I don't know that that's the case. I don't know if I foresee that happening. It's worth pointing out that Jared Spurgeon's agent is also the same agent who represents Jason Zucker. Ooh. The same agent who was appalled when Jason Zucker was almost <laughs> traded at the <laughs> trade deadline this last February. Yeah. Just saying. Yeah, and so it might be tough negotiations, and... Maybe negotiations break down and they do have to trade Jared Spurgeon, and they really don't want to. But that's that's the only way I think I, I see them dealing Spurgeon without, you know, getting an offer that just absolutely blows their mind. It is okay to trade Jared Spurgeon for also more than just one player. It doesn't have to be a one for one trade for a former predator. Yeah, you can trade him for multiple pieces because he is that valuable. It doesn't always have to be a one for one. <laughs> just I'm just saying. Yeah, just, just, just FYI. We no, don't need a Taylor Hall, Adam Larson <laughs> train on our hands. Uh, Spurgeon's better than Adam Hall, too. That's the crappy part about that trade. Um, so along those lines with Zucker, this is something we haven't talked about in a little bit, but you know, I saw stories about him come out where it's like he is basically, you know, I don't want to say groveling, but... He's basically begging Paul Fenton to not trade him this summer because it Same. is it is now obvious that Paul Fenton wanted to trade him and maybe still wants to trade him. And uh, even though he just signed him to a contract extension this past summer, uh, is not very much not tied to keeping him on the roster. And so um, that becomes a storyline too, where it's like, you know, do you keep? Can they afford to keep Spurgeon and Zucker? And that might be the question. And and. You know, obviously we don't have an answer to that yet, but that that could end up being what it is. Uh, Jason Zucker has four years left on his contract at a five point five million dollar cap hit. Uh, he does have a modified no trade clause that does kick in on July first, right? And I think maybe that's why Paul Fenton has a little bit of an urgency to move oh, on. Oh yeah, no, for sure. Because once that kicks in, then you know maybe. Zucker can kind of single out some teams who may be interested and say, I want to go here, but right. I, I, I don't, and we've talked about this a lot before. I, I don't see the value in trading him now. You're trading him low. He only had, what, 20, 21, 22 goals this last year? Yeah, 21 goals. Yeah. After a year that I kind of documented where he came off a 33-goal season in which you know his goal drop-off was kind of significant to the Wild mm-hmm. in their goal-scoring department. And really, you're selling low on a guy that you know you know he can be a 30-goal scorer in the league. Yeah. And to sell him off for just kind of spare parts, essentially, would be doing not only him but yourself a disservice. Mm-hmm. And 
I know there's a lot of extraneous things going on there with Zucker and his, you know, personal life that, you know, he he obviously doesn't want to be traded from Minnesota because sure. that's kind of where <laughs> his family's rooted now. But yeah. yeah, when it comes down to a hockey sense, it really is a sell low unless somebody blows in with a major offer uh, to trade for him, which I just don't see. I just don't see the value in, in selling him at this point because you were looking at Michael Froley going to pick from Calgary, <laughs> which is not good by any uh. means. So let him recoup some value, and this is something our friend Tony has been kind of championing yes. for a while too. So I, I just don't see it. I don't see it from a logic standpoint either, but that doesn't mean that Paul Fenton won't do it. So He really wants to just – finish off the Chuck Fletcher core and just be like, I'm done. <laughs> Basically. Like, he's done a like pretty good job. He's really so taken far. a blowtorch to yeah. it, yeah. Although the Chuck Fletcher core having a great postseason in other areas. You know, <laughs> sure. Franklin, Nashville, Coyle in Boston. He had a goal. Yep. Playoff omelet. Yep. Uh, then you have uh, Nino Niederreiter in Carolina. Yeah. What if I told you at the beginning of the season – Mikhail Granlin, Charlie Coyle, and Nino Niederreiter would all make the playoffs this season, <laughs> but not with the Minnesota Wild. <laughs> 30 for 30. Yeah, crazy pills, 30 for 30. Um, yeah, it just, uh, it, I don't know. It, it will be interesting to see what they do with that. So in uh, other Minnesota Wild newsworthy things of the last week, the Iowa Wild, actually Saturday night, they wrapped up their first ever AHL Calder Cup playoff spot uh, since the move to Iowa from Houston uh -huh. all those years ago. Uh, and they currently sit second, actually, in their division in the the AHL, the Central Division. Go figure. Sure. Uh, they're 87 points. Uh, they're well behind the Chicago Wolves at 98, so they won't win the division, but... Uh, they could potentially have a home ice in the first round of the Calder Cup playoffs. Mm -hmm. uh, things uh, kind of go their way here over the the final uh, few games of the regular season for them. And they got some additions here this last week as Ryan Donato, Luke Cunnan, and Jordan Greenway. I got that right this time. Uh, were sent down after <laughs> the wild season came to an end. Uh, and it was weird, like, none of them were really overly pleased with having to go back to Iowa to keep on playing. They they seemed to be like, we just want to go home and yeah. get some R&R &R and gear up for the next year. But uh, Iowa Wild getting some reinforcements, and uh, they've uh, made an impact for them. As uh, I think it was Donato had a couple of goals in his first game back down there, and they have now won uh, three in a row. And they could be a tough team to... Uh, to see in the playoffs now with with those three players on the the roster yeah. so a good for them i i was fortunate enough to uh cover them for uh uh you know what four or five games last season and uh you know it was a treat and if you see that they have a playoff game in des moines on a like on a weekend you're thinking about going i highly recommend i have a lot of I have a lot of tips if you're looking for places in Des Moines <laughs> to go. I can, I can recommend uh, a, a great many places. But uh, yeah, that seems to be the only good thing going on right now in the Wild organization is the Iowa Wild finally uh, got over the the hump and they're in the playoffs this season. <laughs> to me, <laughs> it seems more dubious than anything. Like the fact that they hadn't been in the playoffs since they moved from Houston is really kind of sad. Like. If you want an indictment on Chuck Fletcher's tenure as, as the Wild GM, uh, that might be a, a really good one because it's like your minor league team was so bad it didn't make the playoffs for, what has it been, five seasons at least, six seasons? Yeah, this is their sixth season in yeah, Iowa. Last yeah. year was their fifth. Sure. And so it's just like, yeah, that's uh, that's bad. <laughs> like That's not a good sign. And that's you know probably a big part of the reason why the Wild aren't as good as they were either. Yeah, Cal O'Reilly led the Iowa Wild, or is the Iowa Wild, I should say, with 67 points this season. Jerry Mayhew, 60 points, and uh, Kyle Rowell, 53 points. Uh, so there's your kind of scoring leaders for the Iowa. They also have some pretty pretty good goaltending, as uh, Capo Kakinen and uh, Andrew Hammond have been in goal for them this season. 
Actually, they only have a 908 save percentage this year, so not it's not all that hot. No, not great, but hey, it's been a lot better this year for them. And uh, yeah, I again, I would implore you once uh, kind of that schedule comes out to uh, check out uh, Iowa Wild game. It's fun, and uh, Des Moines is not a terrible city as. Well, some would believe <laughs> driving there is pretty bad. Yes. Yeah. But Des Moines itself has a has some has some nice spots, so I can uh, be more than happy to accommodate. But again, the Iowa Wild getting into the the playoffs is uh, kind of a plus for the organization right now. And in the three games Ryan Donato has played since he was sent down, five points, <laughs> two goals, three assists. Pretty solid. That's that's not bad. So. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's that's that. That's unless I forgot something. I think that's kind of all we had docketed for Minnesota Wild discussion. Yeah, I, I can't think of anything. Uh, I know there was some other players that were dinged up. I know they said Dubnik was dinged up with something. Um, I forget there was another player too that might have been dinged up with something, but it wasn't all that serious. So there was yeah, some other minor that. news, uh, but it wasn't anything that was going to you know really kind of change. Right, change the future or change any perception about this past season for you. Um, you know, Prezi's foot injury maybe, but uh, that's about it. So, all is quiet on the Western Front. What's not quiet is the NHL playoffs, as that Ooh, boy. carries along. And I think the biggest thing is the Tampa Bay Lightning are yes. full on having a crisis right now as we are recording Sunday afternoon before game three between the Lightning and the Blue Jackets. Blue Jackets leading the series two to nothing. They did the same last year against the Washington Capitals. Sure. Who can't quite remember how they finished out the year <laughs> last year. I think it was good. Uh, uh, yes, yeah. they won it all. That's right. But Nikita Kucherov, the seemingly – you know, at large pick to win the most valuable player in the league this year, not going to be in for game three as he is suspended after a a hit in game two. Pretty dumb. Not yeah, not good. And to further how you know how much of a shock this is of our bracket challenge <laughs> that Jaws Goy podcast did. Not one selection had Columbus winning in the first round. Right. Which is understandable. I mean, we're literally talking about a team that had tied for the most wins in NHL history. You know, so it's really not that shocking that nobody picked the Blue Jackets. Makes it even more shocking that, that what they're doing. So, um, obviously, as, as you, when by the time you get around to listening to this, that series is either going to be 3-0, three, three nothing, which is, you know, kind of over and done with, or it's going to be 2-1, and maybe you've got a series on your hand at that point. Um, so, really, really huge game tonight, obviously, in Columbus. Uh, we'll see how that series goes. Um, but, yeah, I mean, you really kind of got to feel for it either way. Like, this was kind of Tampa's year, and everyone's ready for this, you know, iteration of the Lightning with Steven Stamkos to win a cup. Feels like they've kind of earned it. But at the same time, you kind of have to identify a little bit with the Blue Jackets who really pushed their chips in at the deadline and said, you know what, we're just going for this because we're probably going to lose some free agents this season. And uh, we don't know if we're going to have another chance to have a team this good. That's exactly what I was going to say. Like, I put this in my Minnesotans guide to the Stanley Cup playoffs that the Columbus Blue Jackets, they won all in. You have to respect that uh, as a fan unless your all move or your all in move is Martin Hansel. <laughs> Uh, they they never really got going after the trade deadline. No. But they still got in the playoffs, and now I think you're finally seeing them, like, get going. And that's a very scary team, like, on paper, yeah. which we just weren't seeing in the regular season. So I, I kind of noted that. You just, like, if they could go, like, they could do something. But... Yeah, Tampa Bay, their 61 or 62 wins, they never – it felt like they were going to at least go to the second round. Oh, God. And yeah. as I noted, they're the best team in the league of the last 25 years in terms of regular season success. <laughs> and now they are on the verge of going out in the first round, which I think would be sad because I would like to see them 
win and you know take their kind of place among the great teams but i don't think we're gonna get to see that now so they'll just have to settle with the president's trophy <laughs> so i that's a shock but we'll see what happens in game three i I have to think we're going to see a very desperate Tampa Bay team, which is very frightening to think of, even without Kucherov. Yeah. Um, so there's there's that essentially. So that series has been great. Yeah, it's been it's been a good two hockey. I thought Columbus was dead in the first ten minutes of the series. <laughs> I know. They were down what three, three to nothing. nothing. Yeah. It was bad, and then they came back and won. So good on them. Good on Torts. Like people don't seem to like Torts, but. I, love I can't Torres. imagine why. He's pushed. He's somehow pushed the right buttons, which, good on you, sir. <laughs> then you have Boston and Toronto. I got some flack for this, but I thought Boston and Toronto was like the least interesting first round series, for me. Uh, I don't know about yeah, you. No, like, I, I'm kind of with you in that I wasn't super interested in it. Um, I know that like the hockey world kind of revolves around Toronto a little bit. Um, and Boston is, you know, one of those original six teams that also gets a ton of attention that they probably don't deserve. But, um, yeah, I'm, I'm with you on that. They're two very good teams, but it just it didn't do much yeah, for me. I was kind of like I wasn't marking it off on the calendar. And as I say that, I, it's more of a Minnesota. Minnesota. I, I should be more revolted at Calgary, Colorado, but I'm actually weirdly intrigued by that series. <laughs> so it's the jerseys. I, I can probably see why you. Uh, Maybe you think that's probably your least interesting series. Sure. So I can understand your point. But, yeah, Boston and Toronto for me is not overly compelling. And they're tied 1-1. Oh. Nazem Kadri, the doorknob, oh is now seemingly going to be out for the rest of the series. But should be. You know, we'll see what happens there. Uh, then you flip to the other kind of side of the Eastern Conference. You've got Washington and Carolina. Washington up two to nothing with your Brooks Orpik overtime goal in game two <laughs> to uh, get the Capitals Brooks back to rally with the 2 0 lead. Orpik. Yeah, go figure. Uh, and, and then the other matchup in the Eastern Conference the New York Hockey Islanders lead the Pittsburgh Penguins three to nothing in that series as they played earlier today. Islanders winning four to one. I did not see this coming. I didn't either. I, I told you before the show, I have not watched a lot of Penguins this year, but I'm genuinely shocked at what's going on. Absolutely. Yeah, that, that series has been just utterly shocking because, you know, you talked about it last week, and, and we had kind of talked about it. You kind of thought the Islanders were riding the PDO train, right? Like they were, you know, they get Barry Trotz, and suddenly they get really good goaltending. Well, you know, maybe not all that surprising, I guess, but that goaltending has stayed really good. I mean, Robin Lehner is the reason why this series is 3-0 right now. Uh, he has just been absolutely a brick wall for them. And so, and and how awesome, I don't know how much of you have watched of it, but those first two games on Long Island, oh, my Lord, that that is playoff hockey right there. Like, that is an incredible atmosphere with some just absolutely rabid, passionate fans. It's been a lot of fun to watch. I mean, they, they've done really well with – you know, the atmosphere in that building and, and the chants and, and the cheering. Um, it's going to be like a lot of people have mentioned, it's going to be an absolute shame. And I mean a highest of high shames for them to play in the second round at the Barclays Center. You had some choice words for Brooklyn at the end of that tweet. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I did. Something about a flagpole and <laughs> sticking it somewhere. Yeah, that, something like that. <laughs> I know, and I, I pointed this out in my my guide if you love kind of scrappy teams yeah. playing in crickety old arenas <laughs> then the islanders are right for you it's your jam yeah and they have they've been a a big pdo team all year and that's seemingly going to carry them now into round two and if you really love sticking it to a player like john Tavares who left the islanders for oh, no greener kidding. pastures then yeah jump all, all aboard and <laughs> i do love barry trotz I'm still very bitter at the way his run with Washington kind of ended. Just it weird. Just, uh, yeah, and it's kind of like what Bruce Boudreau is doing, a lame duck yeah. kind of a situation that uh, coaches don't really love. Uh, and they seemingly don't forget, so expect the Wild to win it all next year and then Bruce <laughs> leaves. Uh, no, I'm kidding. We don't nearly have uh, the right ingredients for that. <laughs> no. uh, please don't. Let's not get our hopes uh, up. So uh, that's kind of the eastern side of the thing. It's worth noting 
24 of our 36 entries in the uh, Giles and the Goalie Bracket Challenge had the Tampa Bay Lightning winning it all. Of so course. Everyone's bragging about to get busted. If uh, you had anyone else, good on you. Yeah. But I do think it is a little bit sad, and I know, you know, you've got a fair amount of money on the caps, but uh, it is a little bit disappointing to see the Hurricanes go down, you know, without too much of a fight because – uh, that was going to be that. I mean, if they if they manage to upset the Caps, that that's a real feel good story, because that market really you know needed it. And I think that team has been a lot of fun to watch this year, not just for their post game celebrations, but um, it, it is a little bit disappointing if they end up getting you know being made short work of by the Capitals. Uh, then you uh, flip side over in the Western Conference, uh, in the Central Division round of things. Uh, tonight is game three between the Winnipeg Jets and the St. Louis Blues. St. Louis goes home for game three. They are up 2 to nothing in the series. The Winnipeg Jets have been absolutely lethargic. Terrible. They've been terrible for a while, too. That's, a that's long the weird time. thing. Like, and I pointed I, this out last week when we did our predictions. I think it was Travis Yost had pointed out how terrible the Jets had been since, like, February. Awful. Yeah. Awful. Awful. They're like bottom of the league in most like statistical categories, and that includes like the advanced statistical categories. Sure. Everything across the board has been bad for the Jets, and that is now carried over into the playoffs, where the Blues are now up two to nothing, and they could go home and theoretically put the series away. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Did you, get it? Yeah. you can keep talking. Like we can finish this and then cut it. I understand. <laughs> this is the best part is I left the the microphones running, <laughs> <laughs> and we have our we have our backup producers letting us know that we've hit the 15 minute mark, which is usually when we should cut it so we don't get uh, some uh, non great audio sounds in your earphones, <laughs> but. Uh, to quickly finish up, the Blues up two to nothing on the Jets. And yeah. did you have any thoughts on that? Uh, no, I mean it just—it's a little bit surprising to me that the Jets have been that bad with the talent they have on that team. It's really been—I mean that—that's an incredibly talented team, and they have just played like dog ass. And it's just—it's baffling to me because I, I thought that Connor Hellebuck was a decent goalie. Yeah. You think that he's Patrick, not been good all year. No, and you think that Patrick Lane is a superstar in this league. You think that Blake Wheeler is very good. You think that, I mean, they've got so many players that are very good, and it's just it's really surprising to see them play this poorly. Yeah. The other series in the Central Division, uh, Winnipeg and, uh, no, I'm sorry, not Winnipeg. Uh, Nashville and Dallas. That's the ones. Uh, yes, sorry. Winnipeg's still on the brain. <laughs> uh, but that series tied 1-1 going back to Dallas. Dallas winning game one, Nashville responding with a, game to win in overtime on Saturday afternoon. Mm -hmm. Uh, That series, again, I kind of pointed out last week, I feel like Dallas is going to have the upper hand because Nashville's not been a very good team kind of down the stretch. And Ben Bishop is really good, and we're seeing that in the playoffs still. Yeah. Which Tampa Bay could use that. (laughs) Anyway, fair enough. Uh, that that's probably going to be the most, maybe one of the more compelling series in the West, because there's some, as we saw on Saturday, there's some fight in Nashville still. It's yeah. not going to be like Winnipeg, St. Louis, where the Jets are just going to cool. explode themselves. But yeah, I, I still think Dallas is going to come out on this one, and it's just solely on goaltending. I, I think Ben Bishop is going to. Steal a game and Dallas obviously getting a big road win to start the series to kind of take home ice away from Nashville. Yeah, oh, it's been huge. Uh, you know, I think that, you know, they talked about Jim Montgomery kind of changing the way he was coaching in in Dallas from the early in the season. Uh, college success in the postseason. Right. And so it uh, going from, you know, a, a team that was kind of run and gun like he likes to be to a team that really is – Maybe they're focusing a little bit more on that defense and goaltending and just kind of taking their shots when they can. Even with having some superstars like Ben and Sagan, it's really worked for them. So um, they, they're, they've got a lot more momentum than, than Nashville does right now. So uh, Then you flip to the uh, the Pacific part of the bracket in the uh, 
Western Conference. Uh, Calgary, Colorado tied 1-1. Colorado getting an overtime win in game two to send the series back 1-1. Colorado. Boo. Calgary Flames, to their credit, pulled out the throwback jerseys yes. for their home games, yes. which thank the Lord. Yes. If that's how you float, not to say. <laughs> but they did the right thing and uh, got the correct jerseys out for the uh, their home games, so good on them. They're only, only redeemable quality. <laughs> yeah, I, that, that series I, I watched a, just a smidge of last night early, and um, yeah, it's I don't, I don't know what to make of that series just yet, but I guess it... You know, it's two teams that can actually kind of, you know, run a little bit. You know, Colorado's got basically that one line worth of players that's really good. Um, and Grubauer has rebounded. I mean, he was kind of a shell of his former self earlier this season, but he's really rebounded and playing well. And Mike Smith playing decently well right now. So it'll be interesting to see where that series goes. And then uh, last but not least is a series that we're probably most interested in in the first <laughs> round. Uh, the San Jose Sharks and the Vegas Golden Knights tied 1-1. Game three is this evening, Sunday night. Uh, Vegas did not have a good game one, but no. then they got back on the the horse in game two. They got out to a 3 nothing lead. They blew it, and then San Jose tied it, but then Vegas wins 5-3. Yeah. That was a fun game. A very yes, a very fun, compelling series. Even game one was was fun, and that's kind of why with you, I've seen very little bit of the Calgary Colorado series because I've been saving my late nights for the <laughs> San Jose <laughs> Vegas games for our Golden Knights, of course. Yeah, so we're now a Golden Knights podcast, of course. Yep. But yep. yeah, that's going to be a good series still, and expecting. Uh, quite an atmosphere for games three and four in vegas as they yes they now get two post seasons and two years as a franchise so good on you it took the columbus blue jackets i think like 15 years to get two <laughs> postseason appearances when they still haven't won a series yet <laughs> yeah they're still waiting to win their first right the golden knights in what a round and a half Last yeah. year had more postseason wins than the Blue Jackets ever had. Yep. So, take that. Wolf. No, this is this is going to be back and forth. And Eric Carlson was not in the Sharks lineup until like the last like two games of the regular season. Right. And from what I heard, did not look overly great in those first two games. But he has looked very much like the Eric Carlson we yes. all remember. Uh, as the world-class defenseman and has really made a difference for the Sharks. Big factor in game one. But, man, that's that's going to be a great series. I, I expect a full-on heavyweight tilt because unless Marty Jones, you know, craps down his leg. Again. Like he did in game two. <laughs> yeah. I think that's going to be the biggest thing in that series is can San Jose slash Eric Carlson by himself play well enough to cover up for Martin Jones. Well, And I think that that was the question before the series started. And we've seen it kind of fleshed out yeah. here in the first two games. Like, you know, they, they really I mean, Martin Jones looked pretty awful in that second game and was quickly replaced by Aaron Dell. And uh, the Sharks made a game of it but ended up losing in the long run. So, Eric Carlson lugged a pretty crap Ottawa Senators team to a goal from the Stanley very Cup much, final two years much ago. Did, yes. So, I think in the same kind of circumstances, he can take the Sharks a lot, a lot more. But yeah, yeah, we'll see. I mean, but Vegas is still. I mean, this is a team that played for the Stanley Cup last year, so this is still a very good hockey team and, and a team that kind of took its lumps a little bit this year. Um, but Mark Andre Fleury, you know, he can still put on a playoff performance or two. Like he kind of got that reputation as a playoff choker for a little while with the Penguins, and uh, last season really kind of rub that in everybody's noses so we'll see how he performs the rest of this series i see a lot of people asking uh for minnesota if eric halla is going to be in the lineup anytime soon for vegas no no he's still hurt isn't he? i i don't like he's from what i've read he's skating but 
he hasn't like been like practicing normally with the team yet, so sure. I really don't imagine he's going to get back into the lineup for the playoffs. Enjoy your Alex Tuck. <laughs> yeah, but people, me, yes, fair. Care about Eric Hall? That's fair. That's fair. So there's your Eric Hall update, but <laughs> yeah, that's the that is the playoff roundup here as we close out the first week of the Stanley Cup playoffs. It's been great. Lit. Yes. She's enjoyed it. It's amazing. Yeah. I needed that. Take it I tell people it. it's the most marketable hockey that the NHL should be pushing more, but it just gets shoved to CNBC and the Golf Channel. So, <laughs> USA Network. Yep. There yeah. you go. Yeah. Any... Probably do it. Any last thoughts? No, I don't have anything. Uh, you know, I've enjoyed the playoffs so far, but I mean, even you know, even as a playoff fan, I think the first round can sometimes be kind of ho hum. Um, you know, the second round and and those conference finals, that is where the S hits the fan. I mean, that's yeah. where it really gets dialed up to eleven. Um, so the first round has been good, and I think we've had some good games. Um, but I'm not, you know, uh, my expectations aren't mega high. So um, I'm just kind of uh, taking it in slowly and enjoying it and. And I uh, can't wait for uh, more of it. Congratulations are in order to the University of Minnesota Duluth Bulldogs <laughs> on winning their second consecutive national championship. They are the first team since the University of Minnesota. Denver. Or Denver? Denver won back to back a couple years ago. Yeah. I hate everything. I know, right? Denver. Yeah. Anyway. They're the first team to win back-to-back -back national championships since Denver to, uh, as I said, mm -hmm. take the crown consecutively. Last year they did in St. Paul. This year they did it in Buffalo. Uh, so if you are a uh, Bulldogs fan, which I know we have a few who listen to this otherwise fine podcast, <laughs> uh, hat tip to you and uh, everyone involved. So question that I saw, or something that I saw, brought up very quickly on that note, tying to the NHL. Uh, do you think Scott Sandlin starts getting phone calls? You think he's? Really, you think that he's a guy that doesn't want to leave? I don't know. That's weird. You don't really hear his name float around like, you know, Jim Montgomery for like the last year and a half at Denver. Like you heard his name get tossed around for NHL jobs, right? And David Quinn before he went to the Rangers, you heard his name sure. for a while. You don't really hear Scott Sandlin get tossed around in NHL, but it wouldn't surprise me if it's hard know, to argue maybe, with the results. <laughs> yeah, maybe an outsider thought you know from an nhl general manager said hey maybe we should take a look at this guy because he just keeps winning like mm -hmm. and he's really good at developing players but yeah it, not something we heard of yet but certainly not a not a bad thought if you're running an nhl front office but then again 200 hockey men don't exactly have the best ideas <laughs> sometimes so fair point fair point uh, yeah, that can uh, wrap it up for this podcast before our timer goes off again. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> thank you, to everyone, for listening to this uh, otherwise fine production. Uh, you can follow Ben and I on Twitter at Ben Revington, at Giles Farrell. Our podcast has a Twitter account, which just mainly tweets out Golden Knight stuff now, at JTG yep. Wild Podcast. Uh, you can find this otherwise fine show on iTunes, SoundCloud, Libsyn, iHeartRadio, Spotify, Google Play, anywhere you digest podcasts, we're there. Uh, and then, of course, ZoneCoverage.com. That's where you can find the podcast and as well as our written work, ZoneCoverage.com slash wild. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Deep breath. <laughs> I got through it all. Uh, so, yeah, that can wrap it up for uh, this week. Thank you to our spot-on producers who had to fill in for regular producers uh, <laughs> timing us this week to make sure our audio didn't go too long so that uh, we didn't get any uh, extracurricular sounds in your earphones. So thank them for that. Uh, yeah, that will wrap it up for this week, and we'll chat with you again next week. Later.
it's not resiliency. You're making it sound like we're good. That's all. I'm done. <laughs>